So continuing our discussion with the Civil War issue number two tie-ins, we pick up with the New Avengers issue number 21. Now, this comic is really kind of interesting, and even when I sat down and read this comic for the first time, it really kind of struck me as strange, just because the artistry was so different from what I was used to with reading most of the Marvel comics. And that's one of the interesting things when it comes to these major crossovers. When Marvel does these huge crossovers, they enlist virtually every single artist that is working on their current storyline. And so we see the artists who are working on New Avengers. We see the artists who are working on uh, Iron Man. We see the artists that are working on Spider-Man. And they really all kind of come together to bring us a full and complete storyline. And so this comic, while the artistry is a little bit strange and is really kind of weird, the storytelling is almost second to none. And what we see is Captain America really kind of trying to come, at, come to peace with himself, really kind of trying to meditate, so to speak, as he is painting, and really kind of having this internal debate regarding his perception of humanity. Now, this is really kind of interesting because this is a side of Captain America that we don't usually get to see. And Captain America, for the most part, is always portrayed as being the one guy that always has faith in humanity, that while humanity will stumble and humanity will fall and sometimes they will make bad decisions, he really always kind of has this idea that humanity will always do what's best, that people are inherently good and they will always do the right thing. And this comic really kind of gives us this opportunity to see Captain America questioning that. But while this internal debate really kind of rages inside of him, he really kind of comes to the conclusion that this support for the Superhuman Registration Act, that this anger and this backlash that humanity is showing towards superhumans is simply a result of them being scared, really kind of a result of them being both angry and scared because of the fact that superheroes really are not being regulated by the government and that the possibility of another Stanford, Connecticut really kind of looms on the horizon and that it's entirely possible that someone somewhere could do something that would bring about another one of these instances. So what we see is that as Captain America is really kind of uh, meditating, really kind of having this debate with himself, that he is ambushed by S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, one of whom is Dum Dum Dugan. Now, Dum Dum Dugan is, of course, the right-hand man of Nick Fury, but is also a very close friend of Captain America. And Captain America is really kind of upset to see that S.H.I.E.L.D. is resorting to such underhanded tactics uh, as using a friend of Captain America's to attempt to corral him and bring him back to S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, ultimately, Captain America is successful in tricking Maria Hill and S.H.I.E.L.D. into believing that he's been killed by Dum Dum Dugan and escapes the scene. From this point, he kind of passes out and comes to with uh, Falcon in one of Nick Fury's underground bases. Now, Falcon didn't necessarily bring him there. Captain America actually traveled there on his own, although at this point he had kind of blacked out and doesn't recall that he had got there. Um, he's surprised to see Falcon there and puts him through kind of a quiz in order for Falcon to verify that he is who he claims to be. Once Captain America is satisfied that uh, Falcon is actually who he's supposed to be, the two of them kind of go on this hunt to build a team, to kind of build an opposing faction to Iron Man and his pro-superhuman registration group. One of the first members that they choose to try to recruit is Spider-Man, but after seeing him wearing the armor that was given to him by Tony Stark, they really uh, kind of come to the realization that Spider-Man has chosen the side of Iron Man. From here, we see Captain America and Falcon attempt to uh, enlist the aid of Hank Pym, Ant-Man. But we find out very quickly that Ant-Man has already chosen the side of Iron Man. And so what we kind of learn is that Hank Pym has basically kind of been uh, distracting Sam Wilson and Captain America, really kind of been buying time in order for S.H.I.E.L.D. to have a chance to arrive. We see that Ant-Man is really kind of trying to talk Captain America down, telling him that this Superhuman Registration Act is inevitable and and they should side with it. Ultimately, we see that Captain America and Sam Wilson are able to swiftly defeat Hank Pym and escape and go back underground. And from here, we will really kind of see this duo begin to move forward in the direction of having a sort of recruitment drive in the sense that they will try to bring as many people to their side as possible as we see that the uh, lines are sort of being drawn. Ultimately, we will see the teams really kind of uh, define themselves. And of course, on Captain America's side, uh, we will see individuals such as Cable, in addition to Patriot and the Young Avengers. Avengers, as we saw in the previous uh, Civil War storyline. So as we continue with Wolverine Volume 3, Issue Number 43, we really kind of continue this trend that we saw in Wolverine Volume 3, Issue Number 42, where we have some action, but most of the comic consists of, uh, I guess, plot developing dialogue. 
And what we see is Wolverine is really continuing this quest to locate and destroy Nitro for his actions in Stamford, Connecticut. Along the way, he is tracked and located by Tony Stark, but because of the uh, senses that Wolverine possesses, his enhanced sense of smell and so on, he is already aware that Tony Stark is there. After a conversation between him and Tony Stark, where Tony Stark asks Wolverine to stop what he's doing because it could lead to another Stamford, Connecticut, Wolverine reveals that he already knows where, where Nitro is, that Nitro is in Big Sur, California, and Wolverine's really kind of just blowing off some steam so he doesn't uh, go into conflict with Nitro and really kind of instigate another scenario like Stamford, Connecticut. In addition, Wolverine's entire motivation for this is because if uh, Nitro is captured by S.H.I.E.L.D., he'll most likely be interred, he'll be put into a prison, then he'll go through the uh, trial process, and most likely be found guilty for his crimes and executed. But Wolverine feels like this is a long, uh, kind of drawn-out punishment, that it would take 10 years worth of appeals and so on and so forth, and that Wolverine, or I'm sorry, that Nitro deserves to die now. Uh, ultimately, we see that because of the fact that uh, Wolverine had told Tony Stark that um, Nitro is in Big Sur, California, that Tony Stark invites Wolverine to join S.H.I.E.L.D. as they attempt to apprehend Nitro. From here, we switch to Daytona, Florida, and we see someone who is a surfer, but we don't really know who he is. However, he is being, uh, I guess, maybe looked at by two individuals who are attempting to locate him and believe they found him. From there, we switch to Wolverine's perspective as he is with uh, multiple S.H.I.E.L.D. agents at Big Sur, California, attempting to capture Nitro. The plan, as the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents have laid it, laid it out, is to more or less kind of ambush Nitro, which Wolverine realizes is kind of a silly plan. When Nitro is ambushed by the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, Nitro self-detonates. Uh, from there, we see that virtually everybody, including Wolverine, appears to be totally incinerated. We also see that Nitro contacts someone and takes a couple pills, and these pills are revealed to be uh, more or less um, mutant power enhancing pills, which allow him to detonate on such a scale that's caused as much damage as it did in Stamford, Connecticut. We ultimately see that whoever it is that Nitro was talking with on the other line considers Nitro to really kind of be a loose cannon, and Nitro has become a threat to him because Nitro uh, says that he has killed Wolverine, who is both an X-Man and an Avenger, and has really just kind of drawn way too much attention. Uh, we see that ultimately Wolverine is revealed to be alive, and his healing factor has allowed him to restore himself back to his current form. From here, we jump back to the surfer that we had previously seen, and we see that this individual, along with the two people who were looking for him, have extracted presumably the location of Wolverine and uh, Nitro. We ultimately see that uh, this individual, who is named Janice, kills the person that they have extracted the information from, and it's really kind of stated that this person hates humans. So Fantastic Four issue number 538 largely follows Ben Grimm, uh, the thing of the Fantastic Four. And what's really kind of interesting about Ben Grimm is that for the most part, for a good chunk of the Civil War storyline, Ben Grimm is neutral. He doesn't ally himself with anti-registration or pro-registration. He's just really kind of mulling things over and trying to figure things out on his own. As the story unfolds, we really kind of begin to see that Johnny Storm is still unconscious. He's still in a coma following the attack that he received uh, as an aftermath of the events at Stamford, Connecticut. What we also see is that Ben Grimm is really the first one taking it in turn to spend time with Johnny Storm. And he really kind of um, talks to him, really kind of makes his personal feelings known, really kind of the normal thing that you would see when a person is spending time with an unconscious individual. In addition, we also get a little more elaboration on the events in Oklahoma. And what we see is that there are a litany of individuals who are attempting to pick up the Hammer of Thor. And and uh, the thing Ben Grimm had informed us that the government had attempted to stop them at first, but ultimately kind of gave up just because there were so many people and there were other matters that needed their attention. In addition, we switched to Ben Grimm after, I'm sorry, to uh, Susan Storm relieving Ben Grimm from uh, monitoring Johnny Storm. And we see that Ben Grimm is kind of watching uh, events unfold on TV as a result of the passing of the Superhuman Registration Act and individuals on behalf of Tony Stark uh, really kind of combating and attempting to... Um, 
apprehend people who have chosen not to register themselves. Ben Grimm travels to Yancey Street, where he watches Miss Marvel and various other individuals attempting to apprehend superheroes who refuse to register, and Ben Grimm doesn't really do anything. He just really kind of observes the situation and then goes to talk to the police. And the police are really kind of frustrated here because you have protester people who are against the Superhuman Registration Act that are doing the best they can to thwart the efforts of the police because they really can't do much to thwart the efforts of superheroes. The police really kind of want to eliminate the idea of protesters. They really just kind of want to impose this martial law kind of thing where protesters are just simply not allowed to uh, act violently against police. And Ben Grimm really kind of plays the role of uh, maybe the voice of reason here, stating that just because people are uh, people object to something, just because they do not advocate what it is that the police are willing to do, doesn't mean that the people are wrong. They have every right to really kind of protest here the best way they know how. From there, Ben Grimm really kind of uh, is frustrated. He's really kind of angry on both sides. One, he's angry because this uh, Superhuman Registration Act is being handled, for the most part, in a very, um, I guess maybe uh, Orwellian way, in the sense that we really kind to see the government imposing these very stringent guidelines and really kind of walking this path that could lead to a very dark place. But we also see the fact that people are just angry and frustrated. And Ben Grimm's really just kind of irritated here because he doesn't really quite know what to do. In addition, we see him really kind of uh, engaging in a conversation with several street level thugs in addition to people from the neighborhood. And one of these members, and, and his name kind of escapes me here, uh, engages in a pretty in-depth conversation with Ben Grimm and really kind of talks to him about how Ben Grimm needs to choose a side, how the government and what they're doing just isn't right, and somebody needs to stand up for superheroes, even if it is street-level people. He talks about how they really have no powers, there isn't a whole lot that they can do, but they can do something which is better than doing nothing. Ultimately, Ben Grimm really kind of uh, leaves the scene, and we also kind of switch to uh, the Thinker, who is a longtime enemy of the Fantastic Four, and we really kind of see him discussing with Puppet Master how the events as they're unfolding were really kind of lead to uh, the ability for him to really kind of step in and to manipulate things for his own benefit. And what this really does is kind of uh, demonstrate to us, along with the events that we saw in Thunderbolts issue number 103, that despite everything that's going on, that villains are going to continue being villains, that villains are going to continue scheming, and they're going to continue manipulating things for their own ends. From here, we jump back to uh, Oklahoma, and what we see is that among all the people who are attempting to lift the hammer of Thor, one individual in a top hat and a trench coat walks up with a duffel bag and is successfully able to take the hammer of Thor. So Civil War Frontline issue number three really kind of continues this trend following uh, Sally Floyd and Ben Urich as they really kind of begin to ally themselves with their respective camps. Now one thing to bear in mind is that these individuals at this point in time aren't necessarily fighting on the side of their respective camps. They're just really kind of, re I guess, representing them through the media. And we see that Sally Floyd has been taken to a secret location where she is meeting with various superheroes, which include people like Solo and Typeface and Battlestar, who at one point was an ally of uh, Captain America. He was a sidekick and actually carries an adamantium shield, the same kind of shield that uh, Captain America carried in his early days. And what we see is that these individuals have chosen not to register. They have really kind of gone underground, and they are aware that a uh, anti-registration movement is forming being led by Captain America, but they don't really know how to get into contact with it. And so by virtue of allowing an anonymous interview between Sally Floyd and themselves, they're hoping they can kind of make contact with with this underground group and really kind of begin to uh, build a stronger alliance with other superheroes who have refused to register. In addition, we see that individuals such as Typeface, for example, have opposed registration because they view this to be a draconian law and is not really in accord with the kind of freedoms that have been laid down for Amer American citizens by the U.S. Constitution. We also see people like Battlestar who are against registration because it simply just violates personal privacy and that people should not be made to live in a country that is ruled by a government which forces its people to live in fear. We also switch to Ben Urich, and what we see with Ben Urich is that he is interviewing Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, and Reed Richards has really kind of uh, introduced Ben Urich to this holographic map that he has designed, which is more or less kind of using a mathematical algorithm to determine the, uh, I guess maybe ramifications of what would happen if superheroes were allowed to uh, continue their actions unchecked. And what we see is this sort of 
spread like a plague or an illness where individuals who are superheroes allow and really kind of cause more and more damage and uh, more loss of life as a result of their actions. Now, Ben Urich doesn't necessarily buy this, but because he is writing an expose on the pro-registration movement, he's of course taking this information, but you can kind of see to a degree that there is logic in what it is that Reed Richards is saying. Now, from this point, we switch to a battle between Bantam and Thunderclap, and this is a relatively significant battle, but not as significant as we will see later on. What we see is that this is, in fact, one of the very first uh, instances of fatalities as a result of the combat between those who are pro-registration and those who are anti-registration. Bantam is a pro-registration individual. He is actually uh, one of the first people to register as soon as registration was required uh, for superhumans. We see that Thunderclap is anti-registration, and during their conflict, which is being observed by Sally Floyd, Bantam is thrown into a, um, a tanker truck by Thunderclap, which explodes and kills Bantam. Now, Thunderclap is really kind of guilt-ridden by this, and again, we really kind of follow a little bit of a monologue where uh, Sally Floyd is, is really kind of commenting on the statements of Thunderclap that he didn't mean for this to happen, that it wasn't intentional, and she goes as far as to say that when you're on the battlefield and you're in a war and you aim down the scope to kill an enemy, that it's nothing personal, and it's really kind of an allegory to the fact that despite the fact that it's not a personal thing, it doesn't mean that it doesn't, it doesn't hit somebody personally. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have the same kind of destruction as it would if it were a personal thing. From here, we switch back to Speedball, and Speedball's situation has really kind of gone from bad to worse. And the reason why is because right now, he has Jennifer Walters representing him as a defense attorney. But Jennifer Walters has really kind of taken the same stance that the that S.H.I.E.L.D. has taken in the sense that she's trying to help him get out of the situation, but every scenario that she presents to him where he can sign a document and essentially be uh, become a free citizen is is uh, kind of tied to him admitting guilt, tied to him admitting that the new warriors had screwed up and they had caused the entire incident in Stamford, Connecticut that led to the death of so many people. Ultimately, we really kind of see that um, the ridicule that Speedball has been facing at the hands of uh, prisoners kind of comes to a head, and he challenges one of the individuals to kind of a boxing match to really kind of establish the fact that he's not willing to put up with this kind of negativity anymore. In addition, we see that the final offer that he has given on behalf of the federal government through Jennifer Walters is that he can admit his guilt, he will be sentenced to three years of community service, which will entail that he register himself and act in accordingly and that he will be one of the superheroes that will round up various supervillains or those individuals who refuse to register in the Marvel community. Speedball initially agrees. He initially says that he will sign the document, but then we see that he says he will sign it when hell freezes over. From there, we switch over to a story about a guy named Joe. And Joe is the was at one point the owner of an aquarium. However, the, the aquarium has been destroyed and we're really kind of following these two detectives as they're trying to figure out what's going on. On. We really kind of do a little bit of a jump back here, so to speak, in the sense that we talk about Joe or we really kind of see Joe before the destruction of the aquarium and uh, before he vanished. And uh, we really kind of see that Joe is an ordinary older man. He really is kind of a guy in his 50s, maybe. And he leads a very simple life. He runs a, kind of a pet shop. He takes care of fish and so on and so forth. His life is very basic. And as he is, uh, as the, the pet shop closes and as he is watching television with his wife, he's watching a uh, a sort of news report about multiple whales which have beached themselves and the news reporter plays a clip that they had attained which was a strange whale song that was kind of being played 10 to 12 miles out to sea. Joe hears this song and really kind of goes into a trance where he goes into his bathroom and injects himself with a syringe. At this point Joe's physical forms and features begin to change and it's revealed to us that Joe is an Atlantean, a member of the Kingdom of Atlantis and one of the citizens uh, under the rule of Namor the Submariner. 